so so this is the make files that I was talking about and make is a utility um, that was very predominant like in the 80s 90s and early 2000s right before CMake kind of like started picking picking up steam like and as I said you had to almost be like an expert at this scripting language to create those make files to build C++ programs and the programs I'm talking about are not programs like the ones we use where we only have maybe like a few uh, files, maybe five to eight files. I'm talking about programs that have like hundreds and maybe even thousands of files, right? So, so CMake uh, works off a CMake list.txt file. So let me go ahead and show you this. So let me open this here. And uh, 1337. So uh, this is actually an online Visual Studio Visual Studio Code uh, utility that I like to use. Uh, I get it as part of uh, promoting Git GitHub to students, right? So that they let me use it for free. So okay, so. Let me go here. So it's asking me for the compiler. So you'll notice it's Visual Studio Code, but it's on the browser. So some computer out there on the <clears throat> on the cloud uh, is hosting my environment. Okay, so let me show you here. So what I was talking about. So we'll go to the easy one. See that CMakeList.txt. So notice like there's some commands here. You don't have to really understand or know these commands, right? I just want to show you a file, right? So we're we're telling the program like uh, to make an executable, use the main.cpp file and the hello.cpp file. You can create a library uh, binary file with hello.cpp and hello.h. So and when we run this program with CMake, CMake uses this CMake. A text file to create to create this make file. The CMake utility reads this file, and if you're on Windows, Unix, or Mac, it doesn't matter. Like CMake is, will produce the correct make file for that operating system. That make file is what's sent to the C++ build process, and after that make file is consumed, then an executable is produced, and that's what we run. Uh, when we click uh, right click and then say run in terminal all this is happening behind the scenes okay so and let me show you one more so that was a simple example let me show you uh, how it would look for a more complicated example so if we go let me see like for example this one has more files but with CMake, we can, all we're doing is telling CMake how our files work together uh, to produce an executable. And then CMake's like, okay, let me get that. And then it does what it needs to do behind the scenes. And uh, all that happens once we come here and then we go here, right? We go here and notice this is a CMake icon. So when we go here and we right click here, then all that that I just described starts happening instantly. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to cover as far as CMix concerned, and uh, you won't be quizzed on this. Still good to know though. Okay, so so today uh, we talk about uh, that data types, <clears throat> and uh, if you have been going through the the book, right? the book or if you are somewhat familiar with C++, C++ has a lot of data types. Like, like you can actually be quizzed like on all the data types, but I, 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 I don't do that because that's readily available for you on the internet. Like for the future, if you take a C++ job, if you understand the fundamentals and you know the fundamentals and 
if you're like, hey, wait a minute, I need to make sure I'm using the correct data type, then you can go to the internet and there's very useful tips on which data type to select, right? So for our purposes, like we have uh, integer, that's whole num those are whole numbers, decimals uh, or double, those are uh, decimal numbers, right? Uh, in Python, I think they're floats, right? So C++, C++ supports floats, but uh, we commonly use um, the data type double to, uh, to represent decimal numbers. The auto keyword is C++ or modern C++ uh, attempt to try and compete with Python. In Python, you never had to worry about what kind of data you were going to work with. You would just you just create a, a variable, assign it a value, and behind the scenes, Python knows if it's an integer or a float or a string. C++ does not work like that. You have to be very explicit, and you have to tell C++ what you're working with. And once you say something's an integer, it'll always be an integer. Likewise for decimals and uh, the other ones, char or character and string. Okay, so I'll I'll go through this process and through these examples. And while I'm doing that, I will show you how we or how how you should develop when you're creating C++ programs, right? And this will save a lot of time for you. So I know uh, if you're anxious, sometimes you just want to start writing code and then you write like 30 lines of code and then you're like, oh, let me check if I don't have any errors. And then there's like 30 errors. And that can be very intimidating for, for uh, students. So what I always recommend is write a couple of lines and then compile just to make sure that if you if there's a syntax error especially with c++ which has a more complex uh, syntax than python then then you should do this until you're comfortable with c++ right so let me go ahead and go through an integer example right also as i said before we will uh, be working with functions from the beginning so uh, I expect you all to be familiar with functions, and you all should be. I mean, you uh, went through <clears throat> the Python uh, course, so uh, there's two types of functions, right? Void functions and value return functions. We use value return functions because that's how we can test that our programs are working correctly, right? So let's start off by uh, introducing the integer. So let me... So notice here you see a library and you see an executable. <clears throat> so let's see uh, what CMake is telling us. So we're saying that we want to create a library and the library will have this name, ex0102 library. It'll be, cons it'll be bars.cpp and bars.h that make up that library. Meaning like we tell it, we're going to tell eventually C++ a get.h and cpp uh, check for syntax, and then if the syntax is okay, then create a binary file. A binary file is a special machine language file that the, the computer knows how to process, but we don't. And more importantly, a C++ compiler. And then the executable will be built from main.cpp and code that's in vars.cpp. So if we go to vars.cpp, uh, there's no code here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to say, include vars dot h so there'll be something in the h or <clears throat> what is h h means header file okay so we're saying i there's something in vars dot h that i'll eventually need so we go to vars dot h and we'll, we'll see that there's nothing really right but we're <clears throat> we're creating something create a prototype or function signature i'll show you what that is for void function echo variable with one integer parameter and it should return an integer right so <clears throat> int means this function will return an integer data type and then we're like echo variable is the name of the function has one integer parameter we have to be explicit we have to say that my parameter is an integer data type and I can choose any any name here that I want to, as long as it meets the C++ 
uh, naming convention. If you ask me what the naming convention is, I have no idea. I always say, well, you know, just use simple names and don't try to use symbols or anything like that and you should be okay. Okay, so integer num1. So what did we just create? So this piece right here is known as the function prototype or the function signature, okay? Notice we have a semicolon here. This is the only time that you use a semicolon for functions, okay, in the header file. If we really want to know what this semicolon means, is it's like a promise to C++ that we will eventually provide code for this function. So we're telling C++ somewhere along in a future file, I will give you the code for this function, All right? So recall I said CPP needs something from dot h or the header file so cpp means implementation file this is what we need right the function signature or prototype so once i include it here then i can say uh, echo notice that it knows that i have a function named echo variable variable and then i can provide the code and the code we'll provide here is we'll simply just return the value. Whatever value we receive, we're just going to return it. So if we get a 5, we return 5. If we get 10, we return 10. Echo, right? So we are just echoing the value that we are receiving. Okay, so any questions so far? No. Okay. None here. Okay. Yeah, so this... Uh, it should be elementary, right? So hopefully everyone's following along. The only complicated piece here is, wait a minute, like I, in, in Python, I just created uh, functions. Well, we can do that in C++, but I opt for this method because this method is scalable. And uh, here we only have one function. What if we had 20 functions, right? And those 20 functions consisted of maybe five to 10 lines of code for each function then it would be uh, kind of difficult for us to like read through the code, right? And if we go to the varsh.h and we have 20 functions and we have 20 lines and it's easy for us to understand what the program's doing. So this method is scalable and actually that's how they do it in the industry. Once we get to classes and object-oriented programming, you'll see why we start doing this from the beginning. Okay, so I'm not sure if you if you were introduced to testing in uh, yes, so the header file will only contain the signature or prototype, right? Uh, function signature or prototype. Let me make sure I do that. So that's that's what this is a function signature prototype and always 100% of the time, please semicolon If I do not do this and I try to compile my program C++ is gonna tell me hey You promised me that you were gonna give me code for echo variable. I didn't find it So I'm gonna just return an undefined error and you go figure it out Okay, so if you were introduced to testing in programming one, then the next step here is to create a test case to test this function. Now, this function is very easy to test. I mean, we don't even have to test it because I told you what it'll do. Like we get a 10, we return a 10. And visually we can see, well, in whatever number I give it, it'll return like 100% of the time. Like, I will give it a one, a two, three, four, five. It'll return one, two, three, four, five, right? But this is a good uh, simple function so that I can introduce testing to students, right? So I know students uh, uh, that are novices might come into the main and they'll be like, well, I can use, uh, I can go here and then I can include uh, bars.h and then I can, uh, since I know that it's going to return something, then I can visually inspect it. So I can maybe 
call the function and then display the output. Yeah, it'll work for this function because it's a very uh, trivial, it's very easy. I mean, it's not trivial, like you're not gonna, but what if it's like a complicated function? We can't, we can't do this process. Number one, this process is error prone, it's not reproducible, and it's uh, labor in, uh, manual uh, labor intensive, right? We have to be in there typing uh, keys and we, we don't wanna do that. Like in, in programming, we always wanna opt for automating. So let's do that, okay? So we have that piece source now we jump to test examples module test so here i do not need numbers i will include vars.h notice a pattern anytime we want to use something that we've created we deal only with header files i created the vars.h i want to use this function so if I want to use it in another file, then I have to tell C++ include vars.h. Once I do that, then I can create a test case. Notice right here, test echo variable. So let me copy this template. That's a test case and it's it's special uh, test framework from catch2. So this is uh, the file that has all the code that we need to test functions. And behind the scenes, this statement defined catch config main tells catch to create a main. Remember, without a main, our program cannot run. Here, notice there's no main function. So this statement will create a main function, which will allow our test cases to run, okay? So let me change the name here, and then I'll say test case echo variable. Okay, so how do we call a function? Oh, we can just say the name, right? Echo variable, and then pass it in some value. That's how we can call a function, right? So this statement right here will return the number 10. The way we have it, uh, it'll just execute. We won't see anything. It won't be saved to a variable here on this function, but it'll still execute. But I can say uh, integer val equals. So now I'll have a variable val. This function will execute first, and then whatever values returned will be saved into this variable, right? So that's how we usually that's how we usually uh, use functions. So I just wanted to show you that. But we want to eventually call it, but we want to use this special assertion require. So this is a special function from the unit uh, test framework that is a function that expects some value. So we say, okay, five. So we are saying, okay, number five. If I call echo variable with number five, then it should return five. So we will compare it to this five. So then the test case will say, yes, this return five, and then it'll successfully pass our assertion. If not, then it'll tell us, uh, no, it didn't work. So let me jump back here. I saw something that I didn't like. Um, that should be okay. So any questions so far? And I didn't get some water, so. No. Okay. Um, Are there any exercises or practices that we can like practice these principles on? Uh, exercises, you'll get uh, homework assignments that you can um, use to practice and you can collaborate with students, right? So, or you can always come back to the video and if you want, you can retype the examples. Understandable. Yep. Yeah, again, so like I said, programming historically has been like a collaborative uh, job. Like you'll always work with someone, either someone less knowledgeable or equal to you or more knowledgeable. So you'll always be working together. That's At least that's the way it's been for me all my career, right? So that's why I'm like, uh, close book stuff and that's crazy. Like nobody works like that. 
Okay, so okay, so let me see here. So let me run in terminal. Everything looks okay. So running terminal, the only thing that this thing was doing, it was acting differently than my desktop. So let's see what happens here. Yeah, let me see here. Uh -uh. Let me see here. Echo variable, okay. Okay, let me just try to build. Mm hmm. Did I spell it? Oh, it looks correct. Let me try to build just that one. Build. Okay, so that one looks okay. So let me come back over here. Uh, <clears throat> curly brace, curly brace. Why is it acting up? <clears throat> Let me try to build again. Oh, okay. Sorry. Why didn't you all tell me? Equal. Okay, so story of my life. Okay, so now I should build that comma. Shouldn't be there, right? So we're trying to compare. So actually, I'll tell you what happened, right? The test case framework for Python requires a comma, and the one for C requires a double equal sign. So that's why I was typing in a comma. Okay, so so we are able to build, so now let's go ahead and run it. So run in terminal. So notice it says that all tests passed, right? But let me see, I need to see more. So I hit the up arrow, then I get that statement, space dash s, enter, and notice now like it gives me more context. So now like it shows me that uh, if I compare true to true, then that passes. And then over here is telling me that if I compare the number five to the function echo variable with the parameter argument five, then it's okay, five equals five, okay? So I've just tested my function. I can add another test and make it fail on purpose to see what this framework will do if something's not right. So let's go ahead and run it. And notice that it's telling us that <clears throat> this comparison or this assertion, five echo variable four, fails because five is not equal to four, so then it fails, right? So I can go ahead and fix this, and I'm like, okay, so let me fix it. That was just to show you all. So then I can do six, right? And then I can do seven. This is assuming that our function had some complicated processing, then we could put different assertions with different values to make sure that, that we're testing our function, uh, not just with, with one assertion, but with multiple assertions to make sure that our function is working as intended. So let's go ahead and run it, run in terminal. And oh, why did I do this? I have no idea what I, why I put the eight there. I think it was a typo. So all should be green. 
so it's compiling and notice down here everything is green I click <coughs> here up arrow I get the I get the executable statement right here this works in Windows too then dash s enter and at that time I, it'll show me all the details so compared five passed compared six passed compared seven passed so now I'm like okay my function my function works now I can go use it in my main program okay so this is good to go I come to main I include vars.h I eventually want to output something so I need to include IO stream because that's where my cout statement lives and uh, the last class I told you that we want to be explicit when we use uh, functionality from the standard library so this configuration is okay I know the book gives you this right like namespace uh, start but we don't do that instead we'll, we'll be explicit we'll say are uh, using uh, C out so using stud C out once I do that then I can just say uh, C out something so let me see uh, echo value and notice those uh, less than signs they're uh, Austrian operators that's how we we I mean those are required and we can mix and match notice that right here we say uh, display echo value and then if we use another Austrian set then that means we want to eventually display something else so we'll say uh, that and then another set of less than signs and then I'll say backslash n to create a new line so I'm saying display the sequence echo value uh, display echo variable and then add a new line okay so that's what I'm telling C++ and notice this special this configuration is what's recommended as best practice for C++ in the industry okay I know the books like using namespace std and, and or start right and a lot of times students opt for the easy way out by you by doing well I mean I don't know why I have to be explicit but if you learn to do it the correct way from the beginning then you'll see that as we have more libraries that we use from C++ then we are self-documenting our code say say we use uh, CN also and then we use some other libraries so they'll be de delineated here and any experienced C++ programmer can just come in here and be like okay this is a, the library they're, they're using and then they can skim to the program and, and right away they get a clear picture of what this program can do if you simply use namespace stud then they they have to go and like try to find all all the stuff that they're using and that I mean, they're not going to be happy right it's going to take more time to debug or whatever if they're trying to fix that bug okay so let me jump back so i was in test right that's where i ran the where i ran the test cases from now i'm going to jump back to src uh, int and this is what I want to run. I want to run the executable. Okay, so I'll right click and then I'll say run in terminal. And notice echo value 5. Okay, so my program ran and it displayed echo value and then we call the function echo variable with the number 5 and it displayed five for us, so that's why we get that output. Any questions so far? Oh. Okay, so so that's good. No questions. So everything is crystal clear. Okay, so let me jump back over here. Actually, let me copy this.
what does the return void function do again? Where is the return void? Uh, is it here? Uh -huh. So a void function does not return a value. So whatever statements we have in it will be processed and it, it won't return a value. It will just process for us. Yeah. Usually void functions are for displaying data, sending data uh, over the network or over the internet, something like that. And if it errors out, then we usually use the concept known as exceptions, where we like just stop executing and then display an error message to the end user. Okay, uh, what was I going to do? Okay, yeah. so that was our integer friend, and uh, wanted to. Where's my pen? Uh, here, okay. Okay, so I said that uh, we have to understand memory, so we won't wait till week eight to get into complicated memory concepts. We'll start now. So we have the we have the program. I copied the code, so let me paste it in here. So we have this program. Okay, so we have uh, we have the stack, and this is memory. And just to refresh your memory. For our program, um, display the, the echo, we were allocated some memory, okay? And the memory is broken down into the stack, heap, literal memory, static memory, code memory, global memory. Okay, briefly, the code uh, memory is where our code is loaded onto memory, okay? Literal memory, is uh, the echo echo right or what echo value I think I put right so let me go back here this is literal memory okay echo value so it was stored somewhere in this memory and then we had stack memory and that's where our functions are loaded onto memory so we will diagram that so that you can understand how that works okay so let me see here jump back over here go to data types and this you will always be quizzed on because this will help you for uh, programming three so remember the stack is, is sequential so when our program starts running the first thing that's loaded onto memory is memory for the main function okay so assuming that the main function consumes this amount of memory. Right now, we're not concerned about like <clears throat> what values this <clears throat> blocks hold. We're just we just want to get a high level overview of how the stack works. So load main to memory, okay? And uh, we will not be. Uh, caring about echo value, like what happens to echo value, that's placed in a different memory, which at this time we're not concerned about. Okay, so then mains loaded onto memory, and then the compiler, when a, or the program when it's running, gets to this line, C out echo value echo variable. This is another function. It has to be loaded onto memory. So this one will be loaded onto memory somewhere here. Load echo variable to memory. And it'll be in memory while it executes, right? So we walk through it and then echo variable, let's go into our code. We go into vars.cpp. It comes here, we're saying return num1, uh, int num1. So how is that in memory? So somewhere here, there'll be space for num1, okay? And then there'll be some other region of memory where we will save the value of num1 
which will be returned Oops, returned to main, okay? And as, as it returns, then our function eventually has to exit, right? We return, it gets here, our function starts exiting. Once it starts exiting, all of this memory is released. This is released, and it's free to be used by a program for other functions, okay? So now we still have main in memory, right? So remember, last in, first out. So the last in was echo variable. So it's the first one out, right? It executes, you're not needed anymore, it's released from memory. Somewhere in here, the value of uh, num1 will be stored okay when we get to functions we will get into the into the weeds of how exactly this works okay right now it's kind of like high level overview and then uh that's how it's able to get the value and display echo value and the number five for us then return zero executes and gets here main starts uh being released from memory and then all of this region of memory is given back to the operating system and our program is dismissed from memory, right? So if we go back and look at the program program memory, assuming this was our program memory, this would be released back to the operating system and it wouldn't be here anymore. It would be available for other programs to use. Literal is the main part of the stack. No, li uh, literal literal memory has a different region of memory. We're not really concerned about that in this class, but I mean, I, at least I thought I'd let you know that oh, there's different regions of memory, right? Eventually, uh, we'll cover static and we'll cover free or heap and stack. Those are the ones we'll, and maybe global memory when we introduce global variables. But, uh, for the most part, we focus on stack memory and free or heap memory. And you will be quizzed on stuff like this, and you'll be asked to create diagrams because um, that's how we reinforce the learning, okay? So if, uh, if you're asking yourself, well, why do I have to learn this if I'm here for programming? Well, part of being a programmer is understanding how programs uh, consume memory, right? And if we know that, then it'll make us better programmers. Okay, so let me jump back over here. Okay, so... One other thing that I want to show you, so a uh, new page. Okay, so we're gonna go like a little bit deeper into the stack and I'll just focus on a uh, number, right? So assuming we have something like this in main, so this is the main program. And all we have is int, num1 equals like the number five and then we have return uh, zero so how is this one represented in memory okay so let's let's do that so first of all an integer is created from four bytes of memory okay so let's create the stack here. And uh, we go through the same exercise, right? So main's loaded and it gets its memory region. For right now, let's assume it's that region, right? So that one belongs to main. And then we need some space for num1, so num1 will be loaded here, okay? Let me do something, let me create a few more of these lines. Okay. So numbers are represent represented in binary format. Uh, so this would be one byte, uh, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, okay? 
So meaning a 32 bit number. And if you're like completely lost, it's okay. Like this is uh, just to show you, like if we could see into the memory, how these numbers are represented in memory, right? So we'll have one, two, three, four. That's four, four bits. One, two, three, four, that's eight bits. And that's 16. 24 and then one two three four five six seven okay so let me see uh, we'll have a uh, one two four Eight, uh, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Okay. So, what does all of this mean? Okay. So, to represent numbers in, in bit format, right? So, if uh, this value is zero, then we do not add a one if this value is a one then we add a one right so to to make up the number five right this number in bit so we, we're like okay so let's make up the number five so we know we need the number one so this one will be a one uh, we do not need the number uh two so this one will be zero one plus four is five so we do need that one right and that's it, that's the number five. So then this one's a zero, 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 right? So zero, one, zero, one. So then we have zero, one, zero, one. So if we had a uh, supercomputer memory, then we could see that that's how that would be stored in memory. <clears throat> However, since we are not very good at working with binary numbers, uh, when we work with the stack, we'll have to work with decimal numbers. So to represent this, we'll simply go the easy way and we'll just say that num1 will represent like this because it'll be a lot easier for us. And this is not an assembly language course where we go deep into the weeds of memory. But at least now you hopefully get a, re a representation of what really happens in memory. But this is what we <laughs> will be working with in this class. Any questions here? <clears throat> When you take the computer uh, organization and assembly language course, you'll go deep into this kind of stuff, okay? With uh, <clears throat> binary numbers and hex numbers. Okay, so no questions? Okay, so let's jump on to, okay, let me see here. No one takes up a portion of the same memory allocated to main, yes. Yes, yeah, so anything that belongs in main has to be allocated in this block of memory, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we jump on to another example. So we come back here. So any questions on the variable stuff? This was just like an introduction to like, no questions there. Okay, let me, Go here, go to input, and let me see what I need to do here. Okay, so, <clears throat> so write function prototype for get total with one in parameter and a double parameter rate. Okay, so double. So we return double and we'll say get total one int parameter units. Okay, so integer units and double parameter rate. Okay, so double meaning decimal number, name it rate. Promise I'll give you the code later on. Okay, so that's in the header file input.h. I come back to input and write header file include so include 
input that age. Okay, so that gives me access to get total. Here I can say uh, get total, and then I say int uh, units double rate return the product of units and rate so return units times rate another simple function okay just to get us started here uh i don't think i wanted two pound signs right but thanks okay okay so another simple function like we want get total this function requires two parameters one of integer type one of uh decimal or double type we have that now let's go ahead and create a test case so we come back to our test case we will use the same uh, module one test case so we come here uh, get total so test case test get total function and okay so an assertion so require that the value 10 will be returned from get total if I use uh, 2 as a unit and 5 as the rate and notice uh, one thing here so get total okay so it will not work unless i say include input that age okay so why because i added the function to input that age and if this file doesn't know that then when it compiles and tries to go and find the code for this function somewhere in one of my files it's it's going to return an error but once I include the input that is here, then it should be fine. Yeah, so, yeah, so we can do this or we can do this, like it'll be fine for the decimal, right? So I can do that or that, but since it's a whole number, like it, it should be okay. We won't, we won't shoot ourselves on, on the foot. Okay, so let me, Let me run this, okay? So <clears throat> right click, run in terminal. So a lot of times when students come to my office hour, they're like, sir, my program's not working. And they run the main program and I'm like, let me see your test case. And they're like, oh, I was gonna, once my program works, then I was gonna go do my test cases. You know, write the function, write the test case for your function to make sure your function works, then go use it in main. And because if you go to main first, I guarantee you, as our programs get more complicated, you're gonna be wasting a lot of your time if you opt to go that route. So five assertions in three test cases passed, up arrow, dash s enter so this is the one i'm interested in so the number 10 get total 2 5 10 10. okay so i can choose something else right so let me see uh let's go with uh 10 and uh 5.5 <clears throat> that should give us what uh 55 Uh, let's hold off on that one. Hey, Professor, I have a question if I can. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are you getting the uh, other outputs in the terminal? All I'm getting is all tests pass uh, two assertions and two test cases. Like, how are you getting the 10 equals 10? Yeah, yeah. So, so once you see this, then you click here. Hit the... Well, I'm sorry, Where where is your mouse? I don't see. Well, you don't see my mouse? Oh, 
Uh, here? No? Yeah, 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 okay. Right here, so down here, click. Oh, wait, actually, yeah, I can't, it's in the, in the, uh, Okay, there we go. It was because the the uh, zoom was blocking it. Okay, so sorry. Where were you? Right here. Okay. And then uh, up arrow. And you see that command come up? Then dash, s, enter, and then it'll give you the detail. I tried. I put dash s. What was before the dash s? I'm sorry. You, well, first. You have to click on the terminal so that it can have- Click on the terminal, right. And yep. then up arrow. You should- Oh, up arrow, okay. You'll see something like this, and then just type dash S at the end of that command that you see, and then enter, and then I'll show you the detail. Uh, It's not, it's not doing it for me, but I won't waste any more of your time in, in class. I'll ask you in office hours. Okay. Okay, so, so we're good there. Okay, so then we go to main and the whole purpose of this exercise is to use input, meaning we capture something from the screen. Okay, so what is it tell, telling us to do here? Capture unit and raise from keyboard, call, get, total function. Okay, let's do that. So first, let's take care of uh, our input statement. So include, so we know we need the input.h. If we will be working with cout, we need uh, iostream. The namespace uh, using statements, so we know we will be using cout. We will be using uh, character input. So now notice how I'm explicitly telling C++ what functionality I want to use from this file, the iostream file, okay? So now if I'm if I'm a developer, then I can, or anyone can come in here and they're like, oh, okay, so there's in CIAT scene and any other <clears throat> using state statements would be here and it's a lot easier to determine what's going on. Okay, capture units and rate values from keyboard, call the get total function by pressing units and rate variables to it save the get total blah, blah, blah. okay let's let's do this okay so integer uh units so i'm saying i want you to save space for me i know in python you were required to provide a value c plus plus we don't have to in Python, you had to provide a value because that's how Python determined how or what kind of variable you were going to use. Here, we're telling C++, like use int or whole number in variable. I want to work with a decimal, but it's a data type double rate. So now uh, in memory, there'll be a slot for units and a slot for rate for me, okay? Call the get total function by passing rates and variables to it. Save the get total value to a variable named total. Okay, so we can say uh, total. So notice I can create two variables by putting the comma and then it knows. Okay, you want two variables of type <clears throat> double. And then notice semicolon, semicolon. Okay, that's required. Okay, so then I say total equals it's telling me call the get total function okay with units and rate okay i did that but i need to capture units and rates from the keyboard so i'll say uh, character output enter <clears throat> units character input greater than operators and then we are saying units, okay? So let me explain. So this one should be easy, right? We're saying display, enter units to the screen. This one we are saying capture a whole number from the keyboard, okay? And then we will say uh, see out, enter rate, and then see in, rate 
Again, we want to capture data from the keyboard with that statement. So once those state statements execute, we'll have values for units, we'll have values for rate. We can send it into the function. The function will execute and return the product of units and rate, and we will save it to total. Any questions here? No. OK. And once we do that, then display the total, total 100. So we say see out total. Oops. Total. New line. OK. Again, please notice the semicolons, OK? If you forget, if you forget semicolons, uh, C++ tells you there's something wrong with your program and that there's some missing semicolon, but it's not very good at telling you exactly where you have semicolons missing. So uh, please, uh, after each statement, uh, add a semicolon. Save yourself that trouble. <clears throat> okay, so we can go ahead and run this program. Down here, enter units, uh, 10, a rate, 0.75, a total of 750. Again, no formatting or anything, not at this time. We're not concerned with that. We just <clears throat> want to get comfortable with the semantics. Any questions here? No. I had a question about the include statement. Um, so. Well, does that search your entire computer? Like, it doesn't seem like you need to put any sort of particular path or anything. So, could you put a header file, a header file, like really far away, and it would find it? <laughs> it all depends on on the configuration of the program. But uh, to answer your question, like the first look, the first place it'll look is in the same folder. Right, so input.h, it'll scan the, this folder, and if it finds it, it uses it. It stops scanning. If it doesn't find it here, then it would try to find it elsewhere. But uh, okay. in this the, this setup, I have configuration so that in, input state, include statements are global. Like CMake behind the scenes creates a list of all the available header files, so we won't run into an issue of if it's not in this folder, it'll search all the folders. Eventually, you'll find it. But all our programs will be immediate. Like the input file will be <clears throat> here, except for test cases, right? So you may be wondering, well, hey, wait, how does the test case find it? Well, CMake behind the scenes, scenes is helping uh, the C++ compiler find um, the include files. OK, thank you. Also, notice over here. Right, so it's keeping track of my changes for GitHub. So, okay, we have what, 12 minutes? Okay, so no questions here, so we can go on to the next one. So when you work with, uh, with decimals, like don't trust the comparisons, like never compare a decimal value to another decimal value because you will get very inconsistent results, right? So. The preference there is to convert that decimal value to a whole number with multiples of tens or a hundred or a thousand or what, whatever you need, then make the comparison. Because if you don't, then you're, you'll certainly run into issues. So this fold, uh, this folder doesn't belong here. Let me see, delete permanently. Okay, you all won't have that issue. For some reason, when I uploaded my source code to this, uh, Cloud computer, it was messing up with my code. Okay, so let me see here. Uh, two, four decimals. Okay, so write double value return function name add to double one that accepts a double parameter. Okay, so return double add to double one accepts a double parameter. Okay, double num one semicolon. 
Let's go to the implementation file, numbers.cpp. I cannot forget to include numbers.h. Okay, so write code for function name add to double to add 0.3 three times to the incoming double parameter. Okay. Okay, so. num1 plus 0.3 plus 0.3 plus 0.3 okay and we have to return it right so okay let's see what happened here so any number that we get num1 we will add 0.3 three times to it we will save it to val we will return val okay so this is just to show you that uh, comparing decimal values is not a good idea anywhere in your code, but we'll uh, prove that with test cases. Okay, so we come back to our test case. Test uh, okay, so require that uh, with zero as parameter. Okay, so if zero is a parameter, then we expect point nine, right? Point nine equals to uh, add. Uh, to double notice has no idea what a to double is because I need to include numbers.h include numbers.h and oops to no gusta add to uh, wait a minute uh, trying to think if uh, that is okay. I think there was another file named uh, numbers that age somewhere in my program, and that was confusing C plus plus. If I remember correctly from the previous class, but let me try it here. So we send zero, and uh, if it doesn't compile, then that's the case, and then we'll have to fix that. Okay, so add to double underscore one. Add to double underscore one. Okay, so CMake build. Building. Oh, looks like it's able to build it. So let's go ahead and run it. So notice, like our eyes see 0.9 on both sides, right? But our test case failed, and that's because comparing decimals is not a good idea. Okay, not a good idea at all. So let me. I jump back over here and let me uh, to do, this one should be number two right so so let me copy this I'll go to the header right now okay I'm running out of time but I want to get to this example so this one two and add five times so four five okay then I have to go to the header and add that signature but with double one so I change this number one to the number two okay then I go back to the test case and I'll go ahead and 
copy and paste. And, uh, so we'll, we will use one as a parameter and run it. And then, well, compiling is taking a while, so we will run both of them at the same time. So I'll change this one to two. I'll change this one to one B. Important thing to remember here, test, test adding doubles one exists one time. We have to modify it by at least one character. Otherwise, none of our test cases will run. So that's why I put one B here, okay? And this one should be okay because there's no, nothing else here with test, test adding doubles two. Okay, with zero as parameter. And this one should be what, 1.5, right? 1.5. And this one should be 1.9, 1.9. And let's run it. It shouldn't be add to double underscore two for the bottom it one? It should be that. Let me cancel it. Yeah, overlook that. Uh, cancel number two. Thank you. Yeah. So then we go ahead and run it again. Okay. And then we'll see. So if you ever compare doubles and then you shoot yourself on the foot, then, then that means you didn't follow this procedure, right? So, so notice like not good, not good. Uh, okay. So let me do this because it's not running my other test cases. So I wanted to run this test case. Okay. Let's go ahead and. Uh, Two forward slashes is a comment, right? So meaning ignore this. It's just a state. It's not a code statement. Running terminal again. Also, I did upload the videos already, and I put a link to uh, Blackboard with video lecture. So if you follow that, then you should be okay. You, I mean, to watch videos. So notice here, like it passed. Uh, click down here in the terminal, up arrow dash s enter and now notice so now 1.5 is true but point being here whenever you work with decimal values do not compare them convert them to whole numbers then make the comparison that way you don't run into this issue uh, i didn't catch the second function yeah so it's right here so the second function is named add to double two and then we add 0.3 uh, five times to the incoming num1 argument. And then we return that value. Okay, so hopefully uh, that's the point there. And one other thing, remember the integer takes four bytes. A double, a double takes eight, eight bytes in memory. This makes no sense. So if makes if makes no sense, then I recommend you read the book, come back and watch the videos. If it still doesn't make sense, then you need to stop by my office. Okay, so We jump into one more example before we run out of time here. So hello world. Not this one. Auto. Uh, auto. Actually, I do not need a function here. I just want to show you what auto is. So include IO stream. So Python, you don't have to worry about a data type. In C++, they're trying to compete with Python, right, as far as usability. So if you say auto uh, some variable, and if you give it the, the number five, then behind the scenes, C++ is like, oh, you want to work with an integer, right? And if we say 5.5, uh, then behind the scenes, it's like, oh, you want to work with a double. And I was hoping it would, the IntelliSense would show me with a pop-up context box here, but I, I didn't see it. So you can work like that. And let me quickly say uh, using start and see out, right? And we can say uh, 
see out uh, value var uh, value var right so what are we doing we just want to declare an auto variable that behind the scenes will be a double and then uh, we want to display it like python once you use the keyword auto meaning i want c++ to help me determine the data type then you have to provide it a value if you don't it's going to return an error okay so let's go ahead and run this this is the last example so notice down here uh, value 5.5 okay so let me check something briefly here quick here i need to uh, check something on blackboard i'm not sure if i set up an assignment or a quiz which if there's a quiz uh, it'll be moved to next week okay i just want to make sure that uh, so let me stop